Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today, we're lucky there's a family guy. You know, lucky there's a man who positively can do all the things to make us laugh and cry. I think you get it. I also think you get that I'm talking about Seth MacFarlane's long-running adult animated series. And so today, we're actually going to take another deep dive into Quahog, and we're starting with the very best episodes from each season. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're counting down our picks for the best Family Guy episodes of each season. Now I hope I die next. For this list, we'll be looking back at the past 20 seasons of Seth MacFarlane's satirical animated sitcom and examining the episodes we believe are the true highlights of their year. We'll be discussing some of these episodes in detail. So, a spoiler alert is now in effect. What season of Family Guy is your favorite? Season 1, Death Has a Shadow Although Family Guy's inaugural season went through your typical sitcom growing pains, the series pilot episode nevertheless gave us a great first impression of Quahog. Hey, who wants to play Drink the Beer? Right here. <laughs> you win! All right, what do I win? Another beer! In the first demonstration of his drunken buffoonery, Peter goes on welfare after falling asleep at his factory job and being fired. When he accidentally receives more money than he was supposed to, he, as expected, blows it all as quickly as possible. Lois, I know what I did was wrong, but I only did it for you and the kids. Except for the jukebox in the bathroom. That was a gift for Peter. In addition to the Griffin family, the pilot introduces viewers to characters who'd become staples of the show, like Quagmire, Cleveland, and even the Kool-Aid Man. Oh, yeah! It's also a testing ground for some of the series' most popular gags, namely Stewie's determination to kill Lois and, of course, McFarlane's propensity for cutaways. Dick, you ever wonder what's outside those walls? Say now, that's dangerous thinking, Paul. You best stick to your work. <laughs> okay. Season 2, Da Boom. Season 2 has plenty of classics, such as Brian and Stewie's very first Road 2 episode. We're off on the road to Rhode Island. But Da Boom set the bar high with its next level comedic timing. Airing less than a week before the new millennium began, this episode hilariously captures the paranoia of Y2K by placing the Griffins in the midst of an apocalypse. Good morning, family. Hey, Lois, you remember when I was the third hardy boy? Peter, there was no third hardy boy. Oh, really? Just like there was no apocalypse, he shoots, he scores! Ever the optimist, Peter rallies his town's survivors into starting anew, but makes a big error in judgment by naming himself mayor for life. Sure, the commentary's dated, but questionable leadership is a topic that's transcended the series. On top of that, it has one of the funniest endings of any episode, and kicked off Peter's feud with Ernie the Giant Chicken with a bang. Literally. I'm sorry, this is expired. You son of a... <laughs> Season 3, The Thin White Line if misuse of power was but a minor aspect of Da Boom, it's the primary focus of the thin white line. So take it from me, McGriffin the drug dog. If you really want to get high, it's as easy as being yourself. This season premiere wouldn't be the last time Family Guy addressed controversial issues head on in its third outing, as this season also saw the show tackle Southern conservatism in To Love and Die in Dixie. But when Brian begins to work with Joe as a detection dog for the police, it becomes one of the show's more serious episodes after the Griffin's anthropomorphic pet spirals into substance use. It's really hard for me to talk about my feelings, but... W why don't we start with someone more interesting, Peter? Brian, being more rational in early seasons, decides to get clean. But his struggle is a bittersweet reminder that even the most well-intentioned of us can have all too real problems. If I've learned anything from my experience, it's that we're all responsible for our own destiny. Season 4, PTV. By the mid-2000s, McFarland and his cohorts were no strangers to controversy for pushing the envelope of what a sitcom could portray. But rather than tone things down, they rebelled in full force with one big jab at censorship laws. What the hell? Why are they blocking out all the good stuff? It's the Van Show, starring... Van 
In one of his wildest schemes, Peter starts his own TV network after the FCC goes too far with their censorship. Like most of his ideas, PTV ends up backfiring, but not before becoming a huge hit due to its racy and uncut material. You can tell just how much fun this episode was to create, as it's arguably the most self-aware the show has ever gotten. And it proves that all you need to expose an unbeatable system is a show-stopping musical number. Mr. Griffin, that was terrific. Season 5, Meet the Quagmires. Time travel has become an essential element of Brian and Stewie's adventures, but the Season 5 finale sees Peter learning the ins and outs of the concept instead. After death gives him a chance to be young and single for one more night, Peter blows off a date with Lois and unwittingly jeopardizes their relationship. Lois, we got the rest of our lives for me to not hear a word you just said, but tonight I got plans with Cleveland. Back in the present, Lois is now married to Quagmire and the Griffin kids are the spitting image of their father. <laughs> <laughs> Viewers were already aware of how much Peter inconveniences those around him, but seeing a future significantly better off without him leads to some surprising character development for the Griffin patriarch. It all adds up to a heartwarming conclusion when he vows to change and wins Lois back McFly style. Hey, Quagmire! Huh? I'm just a fool, a fool in love with Sorry, Lois, but I have to do this. Season 6. Stewie kills Lois, and Lois kills Stewie. Family Guy's sixth season had another all-timer in Blue Harvest, the perfect launch point for the show's endlessly clever Star Wars parody trilogy. But this double feature is required viewing for longtime fans, as we're treated to a story several seasons in the making. Who cares? You're not going to kill her anyway. You're going to bitch and moan, and then you're going to do what you always do. The minute Lois walks through that door, you're going to forget all about it, beg for your apple juice, go poop, and fall asleep. When his parents go on vacation without him, Stewie has finally had enough and seemingly takes Lois out. Framing Peter for her death, his subsequent plan to become a tyrannical overlord is thwarted when Lois resurfaces and plots revenge. Stewie, your reign of terror has come to an end. That the entire ordeal turns out to be a simulation is completely besides the point. This mother-son relationship is unlike any other, and to see it reach such an explosive crescendo makes for one of the show's most oddly fulfilling moments. Season 7, I Dream of Jesus. Oh. Have you not heard? When it comes to this episode, it was our understanding that everyone had heard. It's a needle drop for the ages when Peter rediscovers his favorite song, Surfin' Bird, birthing one of the show's most unpredictable running gags. From then on, we never quite knew if and when he would break into that annoyingly catchy song. But this episode is equally memorable for its other plot thread, in which Peter meets Jesus Christ and turns him into an overnight celebrity. Hey, well, Jesus, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jay. Glad to be here. So, Jesus, so what have you been doing since you've been back? We can't imagine this episode went over too well with religious viewers, but commentary about the price of fame, some hysterical impressions, and a brilliant callback to Office Space all work together to make this episode an Emmy contender. Jesus Christ, look at you. You had it all. Money, fame, eternal life. Season 8, Road to the Multiverse. Whether it's Peter's quest to find the source of dirty jokes or a retelling of The Empire Strikes Back, Season 8 certainly takes the Griffins on many exciting adventures. But of all these journeys, Brian and Stewie's trek through the multiverse represents some of Family Guy's strongest and most imaginative storytelling. We all know Quahog was strange, but it's comparatively normal next to the alternate versions the two travel to. It's a wonderful day for pie. The Disney universe, the universe where dogs rule, the one where everyone has two heads, it's all so magical. Combining various animation styles with irresistible pop culture references, this episode dares you to take your eyes off it. It's not only the high point of its season, but one of the show's absolute best. Yep, with no Christianity to inspire Michelangelo, they gave the job to John Hinckley. Season 9, and then there were fewer. This two-part premiere is a personal favorite of the McFarlands, and it's just as thrilling to watch even when you know how it ends. Good evening, everyone. James Woods? 
When the residents of Quahog are invited to a soiree by James Woods, the bad blood between the actor and his guest turns red when the group is picked off one by one. Family Guy was destined to send up the whodunit genre at some point, but by replacing cutaways with startling twists, what unfolds is also a genuinely compelling mystery in its own right. The large pool of suspects gives each of the eclectic side characters a chance to shine, while the episode upends the series' continuity by ensuring that those who die stay that way. Agatha Christie would have been proud. Very clever, Lois. You shouldn't have stopped to say hi to me. You would have lived longer. God, why do I ever try to be friends with other women? Season 10, back to the pilot. There's no better way to celebrate a milestone like 10 seasons than going back to where it all began. Well, here we are. That's odd. It's our house, but somehow it looks a little different. When Brian and Stewie travel back in time to the events of Family Guy's first episode, no expense is spared as the episode makes fun of just how much the show has evolved. The rough animation, outdated cultural references, and Meg's voice are all up for grabs as the writers go full meta. But this episode, more than others, highlights the true dangers posed by altering the past, as Brian's tampering with world events spells disaster for the present, sending them back again. And when other versions of the duo arrive to stop them, you know hilarity is sure to follow. Season 11, Yug Elamaf. Sometimes you have to wonder what it's going to take for Brian to stop messing with time. Why do you keep a sleeping baby in your time machine room? I, I don't know, my decorator's terrible. In his latest bit of self-aggrandizement, the narcissistic dog secretly uses Stewie's time machine as a ploy for hookups. When he tries to cover his tracks, he once again sabotages the present by causing time to move backward. Conceptually, it's an idea that big-time sci-fi masters like Christopher Nolan live for. But this is Family Guy we're talking about, so you can rest assured that we get to relive some of the show's most memorable moments in reverse. The stakes continue to ramp up as Stewie nears the reversal of his birth, but it's not enough to stop the show from taking its trademark ridiculousness to a fitting 11. I've got to say, I didn't think you were going to be able to pull it off, but you did it. You saved my life. Season 12 Christmas Guy. Family Guy isn't a show concerned with fan service. Do you know what I did last week? I time traveled ahead to Christmas so I wouldn't have to wait all year for the new toys to come out. But considering this holiday special was the most viewed episode of season 12, suffice it to say the series had some making up to do after Brian's unexpected passing. Sure, the whole thing was a glorified rating stunt, but the fan favorite dog's return definitely gives viewers a reason to believe in Christmas miracles. Stewie isn't the only character whose Christmas spirit is reawakened, however, as this episode also sees Carter Pewterschmidt being taught the true meaning of the holiday by his son-in-law, Peter. Though he ultimately does so under threat, watching the show's resident rich curmudgeon find the courage to bring back his town's Christmas carnival is just another joy in this world. You know what I want for Christmas? I want my friend back. Your friend? Yes, my best friend. Season 13. The Simpsons Guy. It's a crossover we never knew we needed, but one we're grateful to have nevertheless. Yay! A crossover always brings out the best in each show. It certainly doesn't smack of desperation. When one of Peter's ventures ends with the Griffins being chased out of Quahog, they stumble into Springfield, where they meet an assortment of strange-looking individuals. Oh, and don't drink the water. Everybody around here looks like they have hepatitis. Chief among them are a man named Homer and his eccentric family of five. Sheesh, something feels familiar about this. While the laughs are mostly engineered from McFarlane's brand of humor, this episode completely owns the obvious similarities shared between Family Guy and The Simpsons. It's just a lousy ripoff. Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not a ripoff of Duff. It may have been inspired by Duff, but I, I like to think it goes in a different direction. It's a pleasure to see these two families interact, but it's made all the more hilarious once Peter and Homer's kinship turns to resentment, culminating in an epic showdown that's sure to satisfy fans of both shows. Season 14, A Lot Going On Upstairs For as many times as Peter and Lois have shown how much they love one another, their stubbornness can reach unbelievable heights. Welcome to the Pete Pad, where the dancing's hot, the drinks are hot, everything's just freaking hot. But you can be sure we'll have a reason to laugh at them and occasionally with them. 
One of their more trivial feuds arises when Peter turns the attic into a man cave and regularly terrorizes the house with his friends. What brought about this new living arrangement, you ask? Well, Stewie's struggling with nightmares. In yet another intriguing sci-fi premise that brings them together, Stewie enlists Brian to enter his mind and locate the source of his fears. On top of being visually enthralling, this episode provides even more affirmation that nothing compares to the love between a boy and his dog. You never have to worry about letting me down. I'll always be proud of you. In fact, I already am. Season 15. Chris has got a date. 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 When the middle Griffin sibling gets shot down for the homecoming dance, Stewie helps him record a viral video in which he asks Taylor Swift to be his date. To everyone's surprise, she says yes. But the great night the two have is derailed when Chris finds out she used him as inspiration for more songs about bad relationships. Cause I know you're just blubbering a dress shirt. While it's delightful to see Family Guy lampoon pop music, it's even more rewarding when Chris confronts Taylor and stands up for himself. He may not be the most disliked member of the family, sorry Meg, but Chris doesn't always get his due in the spotlight. When he does, however, it only amplifies the valuable lessons he learns about life and himself. Wow, Chris, that was really nice of you. Yeah, I guess. Don't worry, there'll be plenty of girls for you. No one will ever be close to as good as her, but we'll find you someone. Season 16, Emmy-winning episode. Despite its consistent popularity among critics, Family Guy's success hasn't exactly lent itself to awards consideration. Family Guy has been around since 1999, and whenever it's time for the Emmys, they don't give us one. I'm sick of it. Well, I'm not making another episode with The Simpsons. It's a fact the writers are acutely aware of, as evidenced by the season 16 opener, in which the Griffins parody several hit TV series from the last 20 years in order to win an Emmy. And they pull out all the stops. Peter impersonates the likes of Walter White and Tony Soprano while cameos from Sofia Vergara, Tina Fey, and Aaron Sorkin, among others, only add to the utter outlandishness. While the Emmy board is unimpressed by their efforts, it's a surprisingly thoughtful tribute to television and the uniqueness of adult animation. The icing on top is that not even this episode received an Emmy nomination. And worst of all, you take this big pile of garbage and you tie it all up by having everyone sit around saying, at least everything's back to normal, as if something happened. When nothing happened, it was a complete waste of everyone's time. Season 17, Big Trouble in Little Quahog. Aside from their irresistible chemistry, it's episodes like this that truly beg the question as to why Brian and Stewie don't have a spin-off series of their own. If you're free, I'd love to hear about any new writing projects you're working on. At least wait for me to send it. Their one-of-a-kind escapades always gives us a fresh perspective on the world around them, and that's especially true once they're shrunk down to microscopic size. Teaming up with a group of water bears led by Kyrie Irving's Vernon, the two are forced to put aside their squabble that led to their shrinking in order to outrun a hungry pack of dust mites. Oh my god, it's the dust mites! Oh no! Stewie's bedroom has its fair share of surprises, of course, but we could never have guessed how much adventure could be found between the fibers of the carpet. Season 18, Peter and Lois's Wedding While the Quagmires gave us a glimpse of the early days of Peter and Lois's relationship, not much was made of their trip to the altar until deep into Family Guy's run. Well, it was the 1990s, the decade of Viagra, but also Lorena Bobbitt. When the power goes out at the Griffin household, Peter and Lois regale their family with the story of their wedding. And seeing as how it was the 90s, they cannot resist fudging a few details for the sake of parroting the decade and all of its trends. Friends, the birth of search engines, and the reality TV boom are all thrown into the line of fire. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. For a time gone by, it feels as timeless as Peter and Lois's love. Aww. If I didn't come here, I'd regret it for the rest of my life. I know I screwed up and I don't deserve you, but I can't stop thinking about you day and night. Season 19, Paterminator. On top of being an ingenious homage to James Cameron's Terminator franchise, Paterminator demonstrates that Family Guy still has fresh ideas after more than 20 years on television. Well, it took six hours to sweep up this pile of trash, but at least nothing can windily ruin it. Brian and Stewie's friendship is put to the ultimate test after their future selves sends robots resembling their family back in time to kill them. 
Unlike the deadly serious stakes of Cameron's films, however, the episode finds numerous ways to mock the two for how much trouble their petty behavior can cause. Not only that, but it also puts a clever spin on some of the show's most popular gags while getting in a hilarious dig at a certain other animated show. That's not your normal time pad. Where'd you get that? I borrowed it from Rick and Morty. They borrowed plenty from us. As far as rewatchable episodes go, we'll be back to this one in no time. We've got to show them that our friendship is unbreakable, that we love each other. Brian, we have to kiss. Season 20. The Fat Man Always Rings Twice. The show's later seasons are at their best when leaning hard into parody, and few episodes embrace their trappings quite like this one. Please, have a seat. Do you mind if I don't smoke? I'm afraid I do. Totally understand. The film noir genre is torn a new one as this black and white episode finds Peter as a prohibition era private eye trying to solve a murder case. Like some of the show's best send ups, it doesn't hesitate to satirize the more dated aspects of the classic detective story, but it also wears its love for the genre on its finely animated sleeve as well. The self-aware historical humor will make you cringe in all the best ways, while the mystery will leave you guessing right until the final reveal. It's Marion Lynn Flowers, which is a very typical man's name for this time period. Like Carol. It's everything that makes us glad Family Guy has no end in sight. Family Guy is known for a lot of things, but perhaps most famous among them are their cutaways. Weird, absurd, mostly pointless. Yeah, for sure, but they're almost always hilarious. So here now is Watch Mojo's list of the show's best cutaways. Hello? That's not funny! Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 funniest Family Guy cutaways. Oh god, there are reruns in Cutaway Land. I remember this one, it takes a while. For this list, we're looking at this animated sitcom's most hilarious and wacky cutaways throughout the years. Which Family Guy cutaway makes you laugh the hardest? Number 20. Cookie Monster in Treatment while running a fictional company, Stewie gives Brian two tasks, sending a gift basket to Lois and telling Cookie Monster not to call until he's in remission. Oh, and if Cookie Monster calls, tell him I am not talking to him until he gets out of rehab. The scene then cuts to Cookie Monster in an addiction treatment facility where he's undergoing a bed check. The nurses find a plate of cookies, and after the puppet lies about where he gets them, he quickly scarfs the contraband down. <laughs> He's restrained to a bed, all while insulting the orderlies. This cutaway is a perfect juxtaposition between a childhood icon and the realities of addiction, and it is hilarious. Unfortunately, later on in the episode, we learn that the treatment wasn't enough when Lois catches him heating up a spoonful of dough in a bathroom stall. Number 19. Stewie Knocks Out Will Ferrell and you've only spent $1.50. Well, that's a hell of a lot less than I had to spend to go see that piece of crap remake of Bewitched. After learning that Peter has spent less than $2 for a spacious place to live in South America, Stewie chimes in to say that it was less than what he had to pay to watch the 2005 rendition of Bewitched. We then cut to him in the theater, unimpressed as Will Ferrell's character delivers a bad joke. Stewie leaves and with a deadpan expression flies to Los Angeles. Once he finally reaches Ferrell's mansion, he breaks his silence to punch the actor and proclaim the joke wasn't funny. Hello? That's not funny! Despite the lengthy setup, Stewie's blank look throughout his travels keeps the audience from growing bored, and it flows into the punchline seamlessly, proving that the jokes on the show do not have to be short to be funny. Number 18. Peter Forgets How to Sit while being chased by Mel Gibson's security for stealing an unreleased movie, Peter remarks that the moment was even wilder than the time he forgot how to sit down. Oh man, this is even more intense than that time I forgot how to sit down! We're then shown Peter silently studying the chair in his living room before taking a running leap at it. Obviously, this causes the entire chair to topple over, showing us the iconic Family Guy fall pose. Besides the fact that him forgetting how to sit is completely in character, Peter seeing it is as intense as the situation they are currently in only adds to the hilarity. Cutaways like this demonstrate that the show is at its best when it leans into how silly the characters are. <laughs> hey Lois, look, I'm a booger. <laughs> Number 17, Peter getting the cutaways ready. If there's one thing Family Guy does well, it's meta humor. Peter remarks that football is the best part of his Sunday, except when he gets to schedule the cutaways for the week. 
The scene cuts to him in his living room, surrounded by various characters. Okay, my great uncle wears a ski hat all the time. Griffin will be followed by Nick Nolte's handkerchief, followed by Japanese Abe Lincoln. He lists a few examples of who they'll definitely need, such as a monkey rabbi, and answers characters when they ask if they're necessary. The writers get a bit tongue-in-cheek when they have Peter ask where the extra campy gay characters are, poking fun at how they make light of certain stereotypes. There you are, we're gonna need you guys all week. The scene serves as a way to let viewers know that Family Guy is very self-aware about the jokes it makes, both good and bad. You got no class, you bitch! No, you got no class! Number 16, Working with Christian Bale. In 2009, famed actor Christian Bale had a public meltdown while on the set of a new Terminator movie. The accompanying video shocked the world, and for a while, he was known for his short temper. In typical Family Guy fashion, they poked fun at this by inserting Peter into the situation. What don't you get about it? I, I don't get why we need another Terminator. I just, I, I, don't, I don't get it. During the cutaway, they played the exact recording that was released from Bale's rant, but with Peter's hilarious and innocuous comments. His ridiculous commentary about things like pie and Christmas lights interspersed with the actor's genuine anger was the best way to highlight just how out of pocket the whole moment was. By the way, sorry, I, I, I ate that last piece of pie that you were saving for yourself. Oh, good for you! And how was it? It was good. The show even referenced his rant again in a later season. And Christian Bale and annoying cameraman. Hey, Christian, looks like I'm rooming with you. Oh, good for you! Number 15, Canadian Alcatraz. Canada is known for many things, but one stereotype sticks out more than anything else. Seemingly unending politeness. Oh, sure, that's what Canadian hospitality is all about. If you like, you can have all my money and my leg. After Quagmire explains that tricking a former Flame of Brian's would be simpler than escaping from Canadian Alcatraz, we cut to a scene of a prisoner politely asking a guard if he can leave. The guard grants his request, but only if he's back by bedtime. Can I go out through here? Just be back by bedtime, okay. The incarcerated man simply saying okay in response before leaving highlights just how placid the Family Guy writers find Canadians. The fact that the prisoner was casually leaving one of the more notoriously hard-to-escape prisons is the cherry on top. The cutaway also proves that the writers don't always have to punch down to be funny. Number 14, Stewie auditioning for American Idol. Even evil geniuses get embarrassed sometimes. While in the car with Brian, Stewie says that once he accomplishes his plan of taking over the world, he'll be as big as he was meant to be on American Idol. We're shown Stewie at his audition, singing an off-key rendition of Debbie Gibson's Lost in Your Eyes. I don't mind not knowing what I'm headed for. Afterward, Simon Cowell wastes no time laying into him, even saying that he doesn't deserve to be alive. The whole scene is a perfect parody of an over-the-top audition for the iconic singing competition, from Cowell's dream-crushing comments to Stewie's tearful and angry reaction to being rejected. Next time they hear about me, they, they, they're gonna be like, we was wrong about Stewie, cause, cause that's gonna be huge! Considering this episode was a bit darker than usual, a light-hearted joke like this was exactly what the audience needed. Number 13, Brian can't recognize his reflection. Brian acts so much like a human throughout the series that it can sometimes be hard to remember that he's actually a dog. After chastising Stewie for not recognizing Halloween costumes, he retorts that Brian doesn't even know his own reflection. We then see the dog walking past a mirror, spotting his reflection and angrily telling it to get out of his house. Hey, get out of here! This is my house! He runs to attack the intruder and instead knocks himself out. Peter rushes in to check on him only to also not recognize his reflection. Much like his dog, he slams into the mirror to fight it and collapses. Seeing the two have the exact same reaction despite their difference in species emphasizes how goofy Peter truly is. Are you okay? No, I came in with my wife and now I can't find her. Number 12, Chris isn't ready for cutaways. It's finally Chris's time to shine, as he gets to set up his first cutaway. He starts off well, saying how this meal was even crazier than the one he had at Tommy Sullivan's house. Wow, this is the craziest meal I've had since I had lunch at Tommy Sullivan's house. However, instead of the usual wacky scene, it cuts to him eating dinner with Tommy's family and he tells his mother how much he likes her mac and cheese. When we cut back to the Griffins, we see Peter and Lois incredibly disappointed. 
They tell him how terrible his attempt was, and Peter says that Chris isn't ready for cutaways yet. He is not ready for flashbacks. No, he is not. Turns out setting those up is a privilege, and it's one that you have to earn. Although we have to give Chris some credit just for trying. Number 11. Peter has acrylic nails. While lamenting the fact that Brian is getting older, Peter says he'll have to get used to the idea the same way he had to get used to having acrylic nails. Brian's getting old. He's not the dog he used to be, and I'll have to get used to it. Just like I got used to my acrylic nails. The scene cuts to Peter at a computer with long red acrylic nails, typing something out one letter at a time. He then takes a call with a friend and tells her he can talk, despite having people on hold, all while admiring his fabulous nails. Now I got four people on hold, but I can't talk. Even people with long acrylics could not deny that there was some truth to the clip. This cutaway is an absolute classic and has stood the test of time to become a beloved internet meme. Number 10. Will Smith's Nice Clean Rap After successfully winning over the popular kids, Stewie thinks that he's even better than Will Smith's Nice Clean Rap. We then cut to the Fresh Prince himself in the recording booth laying down a lukewarm beat about good behavior. <laughs> I respect women when I'm on a date. I take them to the park or maybe a museum and I only try to kiss them if they're ready. Woohoo! The DVD commentary states that this cutaway was a jab at Will Smith's rap song, Parents Just Don't Understand. You'd expect someone with Smith's comedic abilities to be a little less kid-friendly with his music. But to be fair, his early work wasn't like your typical vulgar rap numbers. Wipe your shoes on the mat when you come in the house. Someone just clean that floor. Woohoo! Say what, what? This gag just takes that fact to hilarious new levels, showing what would happen if he went full-on squeaky clean with his music. Number 9. Fire Trucks Documentary on National Geographic after answering an easy trivia question during game night, Peter counts his blessings that he watched a National Geographic special about fire trucks. We then cut to a small snippet from the aforementioned documentary, where we see a fire truck stalking an animal herd, not unlike a lion. Once it's found its meal, the truck protects it from savage ambulances hoping to snag a bite. <laughs> The ambulances will have to wait their turn. This gag is too ridiculous to not be funny, and it even has a follow-up near the end of the episode. Peter catches a fire truck stalking outside his house, but the truck shows him why it's the king of the emergency vehicles. <laughs> Number 8. Stubborn as a Mule Once the Griffins arrive in Texas, Brian warns the family that Texans can be as stubborn as a mule. Nope. Sorry, Kevin Bacon wasn't in Footloose. To emphasize his point, we're then shown a cutaway of a mule arguing with a friend, refusing to admit that Kevin Bacon was in 1984's Footloose even though he totally was. His friend tries to make him see reason, but the mule is not having any of it. He constantly blocks out the protest and ends the argument in the loudest way possible. Everyone no, knows Kevin no, Bacon was a star no, of Footloose. No, it was, it was no, a huge movie. No, it was the no, lead. No, 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 no. Not only does the cutaway end hilariously, it's also relatable for anyone who's had to deal with that one jerk who can't stand being wrong about anything. Facts or no facts. Number 7. Robert Loja at the airport. What's worse than having to wait in line? How about waiting behind someone who's taking way too long at the check-in clerk? May I have your name, please? Robert Loja. Can you spell that for me? Certainly. That's Robert Loja. R as in Robert Loja. O as in, oh my god, it's Robert Loja. Peter recalls a time when he was forced to experience this very scenario when he was stuck behind Robert Loja checking in at the airport. That doesn't sound so bad, except Robert agonizingly spells out his name with expressions about calling attention to himself. T as in Tim, look over there, it's Robert Loja. Space. L as in look, it's Robert Loja. We can't say if Robert was really like this, but the situation is just too bizarre to not be funny, especially considering how frustrating going through an airport really is. The one downside is that we don't get to hear Robert finish spelling himself out. Not okay! Number 6. Stewie's Relaxation Spot Before the Griffins head out for a relaxing weekend, Stewie thinks back to his personal favorite relaxation spot. We then immediately cut to the toddler dancing shirtless at a nightclub, surrounded by muscular, also shirtless men, with high-energy music blasting through the speakers. I know the guy that owns this place! It's hard to tell what the major punchline of this gag is. Is it poking fun at Stewie's ambiguous sexuality, or is it the fact that he finds relaxation in a crowded nightclub with loud, thumping music? 
Either way, it offers a short and funny look into how our favorite sociopathic baby unwinds after a long, stressful day of plotting and scheming. Number 5. Alan Rickman Calls Himself While waiting for Cleveland, Peter remarks that his beer looks lonelier than Alan Rickman's answering machine. Immediately, we cut to said answering machine, where Alan Rickman calls himself for a few friendly reminders. Hello. You've reached Alan Rickman at 555-0122. Please leave a message at the beep. It's sad that people are too scared to give Alan a call, but it's also hysterical to hear such simple memos to himself being spoken in his trademark steady, intimidating tone. Obviously, they couldn't get the real Alan to voice himself. It would have been a miracle if they could, but Alex Sulkin does a fairly impressive impersonation, right down to his mannerisms. Alan, it's me again. Remember that turtle joke for the party. If Alan were still alive today, we're sure he'd be flattered, or at least have a good chuckle. Number 4. Peter Joining Book Club Peter gets invited to Ryan Reynolds' housewarming party, and he believes it'll be way more fun than what usually happens on Friday nights at the Griffin home. It turns out that Friday is the night Lois hosts her book club meeting. She invites Peter to join them, he cheerfully says yes, and then gruesomely breaks his own neck. Yeah, that sounds great. Anything beats what goes on at my house Friday nights. Hey, Lois, what's going on here? Oh, it's my book club, Peter. Come join us. Oh, okay. It's true that not everyone wants to be dragged into a book club, but this is a bit of an overreaction on Peter's part. On the other hand, maybe he just doesn't want to relive his last book club meeting. Uh, here's another thing. The book can also be... a hat. Either way, that is definitely one graphically effective method to escape an unwanted situation. Number 3. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Conway Twitty. Whenever anyone, especially Peter, needs a quick distraction from an awkward moment, a poorly done joke, or to pat out the show, they call on a little help from the late Conway Twitty. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Conway Twitty. Hello, nice to see you. After those six little words, we cut to a short video of Mr. Twitty's musical performances, every now and then altered with photoshopped headwear for the musician. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Conway Bieber. While not always used gracefully, this has become one of Family Guy's most memorable running gags, and it definitely fulfills the need to create a diversion. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Conway Twitty. There's no need in going over. It can also be seen as a funny tribute to the departed musician, though Mr. Twitty might not see it that way. Conway Twitty says cut it out. Just write a joke. Number 2. Peter's Life, narrated by Peter When Peter worries about Chris's new phase, Lois and Brian remind him of one of his own previous stages, when he spent two weeks narrating his own life. I looked with a grimace at the questionable meal Lois had placed in front of me. Of course, I'd never tell her how disgusted I was with her cooking, but somehow I think she knew. We then cut to this aggravating phase in action as Peter narrates while eating dinner with Lois, only to hurt her feelings with some rather insensitive storytelling. Lois rightfully cleans his clock, only for him to wake up hours later and pick up where he left off. I awoke several hours later in a daze. Not only is it humorous to see Karma literally punch Peter in the face, it also shows that he's actually a fairly decent storyteller, if only he could control his own words. Number 1. Chester Cheetah's Obsession Out of all the food mascots, Chester Cheetah was arguably one of the coolest, until you gave him a handful of Cheetos. Then he was dangerously cheesy. When Stewie thinks himself cooler than Chester, we see a whole new side of our favorite cheetah. One that inhales Cheetos like an illegal substance and smashes his hand while listening to heavy rock. It ain't easy being cheesy. This is a prime example of one of the show's most hysterical cutaway gags, showing the dark side to our favorite cartoon or TV characters as they become more and more like rundown celebrities than fictional people, further proving that we really have lost those good old fashioned values. Like many adult animated shows, Family Guy is not afraid to take a real-life prominent celebrity and use them as, well, a punching bag. Yes, here now are the top celebs that have been skewered the most on Family Guy. And this is for laughing and looking at the camera during every sketch you've ever been in! Welcome to Watch Mojo. 
And today, we're counting down our picks for the top 20 celebrities most often made fun of on Family Guy. Huh? Religion! You kill me, I kill you, we both go to heaven! <laughs> 72 virgins, huh? You might have to help me out with the last 10 or so because Mr. Happy gets tired. Religion. For this list, we're looking at the celebs the show has most frequently taken jabs at. Which of these parodies do you find the funniest? Number 20, Kiss. Kiss plays a small role in the Family Guy canon, as Lois dated Gene Simmons before he was famous. They clearly still have some sort of connection, as seen in Don't Make Me Over, when Gene uncoils his hilariously long tongue and says hello to Lois. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Hi, Gene. I didn't know you were here. All right, all right. Keep it in your mouth, Rockstar. They do, however, play a major role in 2002's episode Road to Europe, where Ace Fraley is portrayed as a bumbling doofus, and Peter argues that no one wants to dress like Peter Chris. No one wants to be Peter Chris, Lois, not even Peter Chris. And who can forget the iconic fictional TV show Kiss Save Santa, where the band is portrayed as corny sellouts reduced to doing a stupid Christmas movie. Someone stole Santa? That does not rock! Easy, Gene. Guys, let's go save Christmas. Then again, it doesn't get much cornier than Kiss. Number 19, Jimmy Fallon. Having both evolved in the 2000s, Family Guy has had a front row seat to Jimmy Fallon's career, and they love to call out his quirks. Back in 2005, Peter beat Jimmy on the set of Saturday Night Live for laughing and glancing at the camera too much, a criticism that was often directed towards him at the time. And this is for laughing and looking at the camera during every sketch you've ever been in. Who do you think you are, Carol Burnett? When Fallon became host of The Tonight Show, the jokes were aimed at his safe and corporate image. After failing to make a viral video, Peter mentions that they should have gotten Fallon to do literally anything instead. Can't believe we couldn't come up with a viral video. We should have just gotten Jimmy Fallon to do any lame thing. And in HTTP, Peter watches The Tonight Show where Jimmy emasculates Al Pacino by making him play a childish game. Tonight, get ready to lose all respect for Al Pacino when I force him to play a game meant for children. We don't think they care too much for his hosting duties, or his acting for that matter. Number 18, Alec Baldwin. On the show, Alec Baldwin is picked on for his eating habits, which is a little weird considering he's not even that big. The first jab comes in season four's I Take the Quagmire, when Baldwin, in one of the most disturbing cutaways in the show's history, is seen getting milked by his younger, less successful siblings. It's just weird. There you go. There you go. Eat up, Steven. You're the weakest. In Ratings Guy, Peter plays a game called Hungry Hungry Alec Baldwins, where, in place of hippos, several Alecs gleefully devour the colored balls without Peter's involvement. For God's sakes, I've just been handed the coolest freaking toy on the planet. Well, you know, except for hungry, hungry Alec Baldwin's. I, I'm not, I, I'm not even touching the lever. And finally, in the Star Wars-inspired episode, It's a Trap, C-3PO Quagmire mistakes Jabba the Hutt for Alec Baldwin. Oh my God, Alec Baldwin? Oh, shoot up, Pichu. Number 17, Chevy Chase. This comedian enjoyed a career resurgence with Community, playing the old-fashioned and very un-PC Pierce Hawthorne but his trajectory had stalled through much of the 90s and 2000s, and Family Guy was there to poke fun at it. In Brian the Bachelor, Brooke and Brian take multiple stabs at Chase, referring to his vices and decline in income. Oh, and uh, maybe you can cut out when I said junk earlier, the whole Chevy Chase thing. Seems like he's probably the kind of guy who, who might uh, sue. I mean, the guy's got to have no money left. Stu and Stewie's Excellent Adventure shows a clip from the Chevy Chase Show, his infamously short-lived talk program from 1993 that lasted just six weeks. And at the end of Don't Make Me Over, Peter claims that their thoughts are with Chase, which is likely a reference to his dead career. If I'm forgetting anybody, I'm sorry. Good night, everybody. Our thoughts are with you, Chevy. Of course, the joke stopped once he landed the role of Pierce. Number 16, Justin Bieber. Once upon a time, it was really cool to make fun of Justin Bieber, and Family Guy definitely jumped on that bandwagon. His biggest appearance is in season 11's Lois Comes Out of Her Shell when she attends his concert. I know, he's perfect. He's like a boy and a girl. A woman in the audience talks about his gender fluid appeal, and once Peter takes over on stage, he presents Conway Twitty with an old school Bieber haircut. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Conway Bieber. In another instance, a futuristic elderly Stewie comments on Bieber and Katy Perry being real music in a hilarious jab at misaimed nostalgia. Stupid younger generation. Back in my day, we had Katy Perry, Justin Bieber. That was real music. Bieber is later described in An App A Day as a celebrity that became successful despite exposing himself, 
And finally, in the song Thank the Whites, Peter states that the Beebs talks and dresses like he's black. We gave you Eminem and Justin Bieber too, even though they dress and try to talk like you. Number 15, John Travolta. Family Guy seems obsessed with rumors around John Travolta's sexual orientation. The first jab comes in Petergeist, when a cutaway shows Travolta getting confused during his wedding vows. John, do you take Kelly to be your wife? I totally do. I mean, yeah, yes, absolutely. And I I'm going to do stuff to her, too, like uh, touch her? Yeah, touch her and uh, kiss her and touch her penis. I mean, no, not that, not that. In Mr. and Mrs. Stewie, Peter grows incensed over Lois buying twin beds and makes a questionable comparison to the Travolta's supposed sleeping arrangements. Lois, if God wanted me to not sleep with my wife, he would have made me John Travolta. In Big Fat, Quagmire invokes Travolta when explaining how he nabbed a private plane. Oh, a private plane? I just swing that, Quagmire. Well, let's just say I walked in on John Travolta with not Kelly Preston. And finally, a cutaway in Peter's Def Jam shows Travolta as a pilot encouraging his passengers to reveal their sexual identities. This is your captain speaking. We have reached our cruising altitude. It is now safe to take off your wigs and be gay. Jeez, the Family Guy writers are so obsessed with Travolta's sex life, you'd think they have something to hide. Number 14, Coldplay. Family Guy's writers and producers clearly are not touched by Coldplay's music. In one hilarious cutaway, Peter is kicked out of the band after suggesting they change up their signature style. Guys, guys, I got an idea. How about we do a song that's not whiny bullshit? In Valentine's Day in Quahog, Meg's date confidently states his opinion of Coldplay in reference to his own personal style. Do you like Coldplay? Uh, am I a dull white guy? Yes, I like Coldplay. The writers also take a dig at their overly sentimental music, as clocks can be heard playing during a cliché fictional movie about a busy corporate woman finding love. Over the next 90 minutes, I'd like to show you that all your problems can be solved by my penis. endured criticism in the past for being overly sensitive, the members of Coldplay are no strangers to jokes like these, and they certainly take them in stride. Number 13, Tom Cruise. When it comes to making fun of Tom Cruise, nothing is off the table for the Family Guy writers. They go after his bizarre Oprah appearance. They go after Scientology, like showing Katie Holmes escaping from an ankle bracelet. I love you, Katie. I love you too, Tom. Oh my god, I'm free! She proceeds to free multiple prisoners, all of whom are male. The episode Meet the Quagmire shows a theory about why Cruz runs in all his movies. And of course, they go after his height. The so-called director's cut of Mission Impossible 5 shows Cruz using a step stool, and the recurring character Tiny Tom Cruise is an obvious jab at his surprisingly short stature. <gasps> wow, Tom Cruise! You look, um, bigger in the movies. Number 12, Caitlyn Jenner. Jenner came out as a trans woman in 2015 and subsequently underwent a very public transition. And you know Family Guy, they like to provoke. As a result, the show has gone after Jenner on numerous occasions. In fact, there were references to Jenner's gender long before she revealed her transgender status to the world. For example, in the 2009 episode We Love You, Conrad, Stewie says the following, An elegant, beautiful Dutch woman. Later, Stewie and Brian meet a prisoner who made critical remarks about Jenner. Hey, what are you in for? I said Caitlyn Jenner wasn't brave and beautiful. Brian, there's some bad people in here. There are certainly more jokes, but they're mostly too rude or offensive to show here. Needless to say, Family Guy has never been a show to avoid sensitive subjects or to handle them sensitively. Well, in the words of trailblazer Caitlyn Jenner, I will do anything for money and attention. So brave. Number 11, Madonna. Like with Tom Cruise, Family Guy goes after many different aspects of Madonna's persona. Some of the jokes are quite crude, like when Peter, Brian, and Francis call her stupid. Could there be anyone stupider than me? Madonna? Oh, yeah, she's pretty stupid. That, well, that's something we can all agree on, right? right? Absolutely, yeah, Francis. Oh, major idiot. Other jokes are aimed at her supposedly selfish behavior, like when Meg's date brings Madonna a human heart. And yes, there are a plethora of jokes aimed at her age. During a game of Truth or Dare, Peter refuses to say that she looks old. When Peter is looking for the Fountain of Youth, he surmises that he's nowhere close after stumbling onto a Madonna concert. And in Peter's progress, Madonna is shown to be a settler of Quahog in the 17th century. There was no hint of
Number 10. Robin Williams The late Robin Williams was no stranger to Family Guy, and while there was some respectful stuff sprinkled here and there, many jokes are still made at his expense. In Mixed Stroke, Peter listens to William's manic stand-up for about 30 seconds before growing annoyed and going outside for a break. Politics. Huh? Politics? Well, we're gonna come down there and take all your oil, but this is our oil. Yeehaw! Well, here's my missile. Okay, take it, take it. Politics. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna take a five-minute break. Huh? Five-minute break? In Family Guy viewer mail number two, Jeff Ross claims that he wants to punch Williams in the face while watching his movies. And speaking of movies, Peter refuses a free copy of What Dreams May Come in Brian's Got a Brand New Bag. I want to buy this. Great. And as a bonus, I'll throw in What Dreams May Come with Robin Williams. No, thank you. No charge. I do not want it. And in what's perhaps the darkest joke aimed at Williams, there's the whole Patch Adams bit. Number 9. Michael J. Fox as the star of Back to the Future, Michael J. Fox has appeared numerous times on Family Guy, as the show either references or parodies the character of Marty McFly. But they've also made fun of Fox himself, and, well, prepare to get sad. Hi, I'm Peter Griffin. Now, we were going to show you the actual scene, but it, it would just make us all sad. Fox was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 1991, and the disease is referenced multiple times on the show. He makes a very poor letter Z in a remake of Zorro, and Stewie warns Fox about his disease in The Juice is Loose. Perhaps the biggest joke is the one-two punch seen in Teagues for Two, in which Fox spills wine on Peter's shirt and then writes him an uncashable check. Well, I sent him the bill, and he sent me this check, but uh, it, it's, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to cash this. Number 8. Ryan Reynolds Reynolds is one of the most beloved actors of our time, and even Family Guy can't resist falling for his charms. But they do so, of course, in their own way. In the episode Follow the Money, Quagmire's parent Ida Davis is shown sarcastically complimenting him. And as always, I am joined by my trusty psychic, Ryan Reynolds. I knew you'd say that. <laughs> Piano? Comedy? What don't you do? In Farmer Guy, Peter is portrayed as the owner of a failed video store that only rented copies of Ryan Reynolds and Sandra Bullock's movie The Proposal. I have a poster from The Proposal you can look at. You'll get most of the story. Huh, they seem pretty mismatched. There you go. Reynolds' major appearance, however, comes in Season 10's Stewie Goes for a Drive, when he actually voices a homoerotic version of himself. Throughout the episode, Reynolds spends most of his time implying that he's attracted to Peter. He draws attention to his low-riding pants, tries to get his lower abdomen tickled, and gets way too intimate at dinner. If Ryan is not the best sport, we don't know who is. Is it me, or did she just make that weird? Number 7. O.J. Simpson this celebrity's infamous murder case is parodied numerous times on the show. The White Bronco chase is referenced twice, both when Cleveland helps Peter and Lois escape and when Griffin ancestors flee from the law on a literal White Bronco. There have also been at least two cases in which a Griffin has been revealed to be involved in the infamous case. In Long John Peter, Peter does the deed and Simpson is blamed. And another episode shows a drunk Stewie planting the idea in Simpson's head. Telling you, Juice, she's screwing around behind your back. And, and if I were in your Bruno Malis, I wouldn't stand for it. Another Mai Tai? Thanks. So listen. And finally, the episode The Juice is Loose is based entirely on Peter befriending Simpson and encountering resistance from the angry citizens of Quahog. He brutally killed his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman. O.J. Simpson? Yes. Was this in the news? And that is just a small taste of the barrage. Number 6. George W. Bush Serving as president from 2001 to 2009, George W. Bush ran the country through much of Family Guy's glory years. And let us tell you, they were not shy about taking pot shots. Bush is a recurring character on the show, having appeared in countless cutaways. Most of the jokes are aimed at his supposed incompetence as president, general foolishness, and childish behavior. The latter is captured in numerous jokes, like getting excited about a slinky going down the stairs and crying after knocking over a snow globe. In one of the show's best jabs, Bush shows up to Vietnam comically late. Oh, man, I just got your messages and I, I oh, I'm sorry. George, it's been over for a while. Really? Yeah, it's 1981. It's, uh, oh, oh, wow, oh, so I'm way late. Oh, boy. Something tells us the writers weren't fans. Number 5. Tom Brady Like George Bush, Tom Brady is a recurring character on Family Guy, likely owing to Quahog being in New England. Brady's biggest appearance comes in Patriot Games, as he voices himself and helps Peter get a job on the team. Peter, that was amazing. I've never seen a guy your size who could move like that. 
How would you like to play for the New England Patriots? Peter is also a huge fan of Brady and mentions him numerous times, but not everything is nice. The episode Love Story Guy makes reference to Deflategate as Brady purchases some deflated footballs. Cutaway Land also makes reference to Brady's past friendship with Donald Trump as Peter and Lois are disappointed by his MAGA hat. And perhaps the darkest joke sees a drunk Peter offering to give Chris a Tom Brady kiss, a reference to Brady controversially kissing his 11-year-old son on the lips. Chris, are you awake? Chris, you, do you want a you wanna Tom Brady kiss? Number 4. Jay Leno Another late-night host, Jay Leno doesn't get off any easier. In fact, he arguably gets it worse. For one thing, they make fun of his physical appearance as fictionalized Leno always appears with a massively exaggerated chin. They also take digs at his high-pitched voice, bizarre laugh, and delivery style in episodes I Dream of Jesus and Screams of Silence, the story of Brenda Q. Here's a bunch of words in a row. Because the economy's so bad, they've decided they're gonna shut down all the prisons. Yeah, yeah, and, and they're gonna send all the inmates to Congress. Ironically, or perhaps sarcastically, Stewie is portrayed as a fan of Leno's when seen vehemently defending him after Peter makes fun of his terrible sense of humor in The King is Dead. It is so fashionable to take a shot at Jay Leno. Look, look, the fact is the man is out there every bloody night with fresh material and is charming. And don't think that his fashion is off limits either, as season 14's underage Peter takes a swipe at Leno's obsessive love of denim. So be thankful, Jimmy Fallon. It could be a lot worse. Have you seen some of these laws they've got now about denim? You know, I say, if you don't like it, you may as well Levi's. Who's voting for these mayors? Rhode Island's a mess from top to bottom. Number three, The Beatles. Being one of the most influential bands in music history does not shield you from parody, and Family Guy is here to prove it. The Beatles and the individual members have long been targets of the show, and the jokes range far and wide. There's a jab at Yoko Ono breaking up the band as Stewie introduces her to John Lennon. Now fess up or I'll do to you what I did to John Lennon. John, have you met Yoko? Yoko, John? There are jokes about Paul McCartney's ex-wife Heather Mills. There are references to their iconic appearance on Ed Sullivan. And yes, there are multiple jokes aimed at poor Ringo. Even these vary in theme, with shots taken at his physical looks and his inferior contributions to the band. Like when his song is put on the fridge like a children's drawing. Hey guys, I wrote a song. Oh, that's great. Oh, good, Ringo. Fantastic. You know what? I'm gonna put it right here. Right on the refrigerator. Number 2. Bill Cosby Even before Bill Cosby's infamous downfall, he was a recurring target on Family Guy. Most of the jokes centered around Cosby's wacky facial expressions and unique way of speaking, like when Stewie appears on Kids Say the Darndest Things. Stewie, what do you think candy is made out of? Sunshine and farts. What the hell kind of question is that? I love candy. When I was a little boy, we would play stickball. Of course, the jokes got a lot darker once the allegations came to light, like when he appears in a Princess Bride parody with Stewie. The joke is taken even more literally in V is for Mystery, which shows a group of women sleeping at the dinner table. Or how about the Cosby Show opening that has Cosby dancing around the passed out cast members? No, Family Guy was not afraid of going there. We now return to the Cosby Show, knowing what we know now. Number 1. James Woods Unlike Adam West, James Woods actually plays himself, albeit with a few major caveats. James first appeared in Season 4's Peter's Got Woods as an insanely jealous, petty, and neurotic person. I don't know, Peter. I had this crazy idea that you and I were supposed to have dinner tonight. But I guess you had other plans, huh? His clash with Peter and Brian was so memorable, it led to him becoming a regular antagonist on the show. He steals Peter's identity, ruins Brian's TV pilot, and even transfuses the life force of a 17-year-old girl so he can return from the dead. And in accordance with Hollywood law, her life force was infused into me, bringing me back from the dead. It was all very hilarious, but things seem to have turned sour between Woods and the show's producers over his controversial tweets and his issue with some of their scripts. Ah oh, well, it was fun while it lasted. You know, Scooter, we don't allow hats at the dinner table. Oh, my bad, Mr. G. Dad, no! Aha! I should have known! Get out of my house right now, son of a bitch!
Well, in addition to satirizing celebrities, Family Guy has also parodied plenty of movies over its run. Yes, from Poltergeist to Taken, no film is safe. I'm joy. I'm sadness. I'm anger. I'm disgust. I'm poo. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 Family Guy movie parodies. <laughs> For this list, we're looking at the best times this long-running animated series went after our favorite movies. We won't be discluding parodies of films that were adapted from another medium, as long as there's enough of a cinematic thread at play. What movie do you want the show to lampoon next? Number 20. Stand By Me One of the best episodes in the show's history, Three Kings puts a Family Guy spin on three films adapted from the works of Stephen King. One segment covers Misery, another Stand By Me, and the last will save for its own entry down the line. The Stand By Me one sees Peter, Quagmire, Joe, and Cleveland standing in for the main four boys as they make their trek to see a dead body. Oh, oh my legs! Another train! Ah! 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 There's a multitude of clever jabs at the film, from making the train sequence even more over the top to taking a pot shot at one of the actors, Jerry O'Connell. But the piece de résistance is how they actually got Richard Dreyfus to do the narration again. Cleve grew up and went on to marry Rebecca Romaine. Actually, I'm not even joking about that. The fat kid from Stand By Me is now married to Rebecca Romaine. Can you believe that? I swear to God, look it up on the internet. Doesn't that piss you off? Number 19, Kill Bill Volume 1. Much like the last episode, this one splits its parodies into three segments, this time going after a trio of prominent directors. While the ones on the distinctive styles of Wes Anderson and Michael Bay are well and good, if we have to pick a specific movie, it has to be the Kill Bill bit from the end of the Quentin Tarantino segment. After a whole Pulp Fiction send-up, Peter is fired from the brewery and later taken out by his boss Angela. Upon awakening from a coma, he sets out for revenge. But instead of the bride's signature yellow jumpsuit, Peter dresses like Ronald McDonald. Sorry, that's my car alarm. Cleveland, turn that off! I'm pressing the button. You gotta put the keys in the ignition. I've been doing that, but oh, there we go. The subsequent fight replacing the crazy 88s with Trisha Takanawa's makes sure to match Tarantino's penchant for extreme bloodletting. Peter, you can tell I'm different because my weapon is different. Number 18, The Music Man. We're willing to bet that a lot of you didn't know what this was from the first time you saw it. And while the song originates from the Music Man stage musical, we just can't not include it here. Ship poopy, ship poopy, ship poopy, but you can win her yet. After impressing superstar quarterback Tom Brady, Peter gets on the roster for the New England Patriots. Despite being so out of shape, he does surprisingly well, and upon scoring, gives the crowd a touchdown dance they've never seen before. Does it have anything to do with football? Absolutely not. But we'd be lying if we said their rendition of Shapoopy doesn't get the job done, even if Tom's far from pleased. Number 17, North by Northwest. While the inciting incident for this spoof is Peter stealing from Mel Gibson a copy of The Passion of the Christ 2, which is itself a double parody of Rush Hour. Man, you crazy, Jesus! You crazy! That's what my ex-wife said. The last third of the episode is all North by Northwest. Well, and a little Blues Brothers. It hits a lot of the iconic beats from the Hitchcock movie starting with Peter trying to bury the film reel only to make like Cary Grant and be nearly run down by a crop duster. On the run from Gibson, Peter and Lois are similarly cornered atop Mount Rushmore by the climax. <laughs> hey, Lois, look, I'm a booger. <laughs> if anything, it really gets us in the mood to revisit the classic thriller. Number 16, Little Shop of Horrors. Forget the music, man. Little Shop of Horrors is a movie musical that's been lampooned to death on the show. So much so that we couldn't pick just one bit. Perhaps the most plot-heavy parody comes in the episode Brian the Bachelor, wherein Chris's pimple Doug takes on a deadly sentience and talks similarly to Audrey too. I don't think you're a very good friend. I'm not gonna listen to you anymore. Oh yeah? Well, I'm inside your head now, fatty. 
and I just might reach into your brain and do this. The most uncomfortable reference, though, has to be when Herbert sings Somewhere That's Green from the musical. In the fine soul scented air, somewhere that's green. Honestly, we kind of wish we could burn this one from our memories, which may be the best compliment we could give it. And who could forget the flashback of Peter portraying the carnivorous plant in a school play? This is Andrews, I pooped in the pot again. I'm gonna need somebody to clean me up. <laughs> it's really bad this time. Number 15, Taken. Speaking of making a movie that much more uncomfortable, the episode Lego My Mego does so to the action movie Taken when it's instead Meg who gets kidnapped while on a trip to Paris. I don't know who you are, I don't know what you want, but I have a very particular lack of skills. I will never be able to find you, but what I do have is two dollars and a Casio wristwatch. You can have one of them. From there, Brian and Stewie embody their inner Liam Neeson and go after her. But things take a bit of a turn when they go undercover and Stewie is entered into an auction. But since this is a Meg episode, it has to get some jabs in at her expense. Oh my god, Meg! Wonder what music they're gonna use for her. Yeah, seems about right. The biggest comes in the form of a twist when she learns her buyer is actually the full package. But because she's Meg and can't have nice things, Stewie completes the mission by blowing off the guy's head. Number 14, 12 Angry Men. Sidney Lumet's 12 Angry Men is a masterclass in contained storytelling and expert dialogue. So it's a little surprising that Family Guy actually lives up to it, at least by parody standards. <laughs> was a movie with Jennifer Lopez that did not live up to expectations. Much like the film, the episode revolves around a jury room deliberating on Mayor West's fate on a murder charge. At first, Brian is the only one who votes not guilty, but soon rallies the others to his cause. It's not so much a send-up of the film itself, but rather an excuse for a quasi-bottle episode whereby a bunch of series regulars can riff. And it totally works. Look, I just don't think he could have done it. Guilty. Oh, oh, guilty is the other one? Well, I don't know. Number 13, Anchors Away. Much like the Shapoopy musical number, this one's almost entirely copy and paste, but it gracefully establishes a dialogue with classic cinema. And with that, we cannot argue. You may think that song and dance is dated, boring and dry, but you might just learn to like it if you give it a try. While on a quest to retrieve Stewie's bear Rupert, he and Brian are prompted to break into song and dance to pay their way. And the song they choose is almost verbatim the worry song from Anchors Away. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. One, two, three. La, 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 la. La, 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 la. You see? It's easy. Not content with hitting the literal beats, Stewie then enters the movie and, taking the place of Jerry Mouse, dances alongside a live-action Gene Kelly. We'd like to think that if Kelly were around to see this, he'd be as tickled pink as us. Okay, you can have the helicopter. Number 12, Film Noirs. While the title of this episode, The Fat Man Always Rings Twice, is clearly a play on the 1946 film, The Postman Always Rings Twice, it's more of a parody of film noir in general. While that might separate it from the other entries on this list, the episode is simply too good to pass up. It sees Peter as a private eye named Mac Book Pro, tasked with investigating the disappearance of Sister Megan. Recognize her? Of course, that's Sister Megan. She runs the church orphanage. And how about this photo? I don't know. Any dunking photo where you don't see the ground is very suspicious. I see. The episode has all the hallmarks of a great noir. Black and white cinematography, a moody tone, and excessive narration. But all through the glorious lens of Family Guy. Say, can we go to the next scene with one of those cinematic sideways wipes they used to do in the 30s? I don't know. I did a sideways wipe this morning. I don't recommend it. Not a good way to make friends on the trolley. The show may not be as sharp this late in its run, but it's good to see that the parody episodes are still firing on all cylinders. Number 11, Office Space. 
Oh, have you not heard about this parody? It was our understanding that everyone had heard. Heard what? Brian, don't! When Peter goes off the rails with his love for the song Surfin' Bird, he gets on everyone's nerves, especially Brian and Stewie. After stealing his record Mission Impossible style, the duo takes it out to pasture, literally, by going to town on it in an open field with a baseball bat. The camera angles and use of the Ghetto Boys song still makes this one unmistakable, as it's almost a direct recreation of the scene from Office Space where the gang destroys the printer. All alone it was a ghetto, nothing but the ghetto. Taking short steps one foot at a time and kept my head low and never let go. Cause if I let go, then I'd be spineless, I'm going insane. I'll my mind, yes. You know what they say. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, even in parody form. Number 10. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory In the episode Wasted Talent, Peter and his buddies learn of an upcoming tour of the Pawtucket Brewery. To win a spot on the tour, they need to find a silver scroll hidden inside a random bottle of beer. Sound familiar? I found it! I found the last scroll! He found it! Oh my god! Run home, Peter! Run as fast as you can! Not only is this storyline ripped straight from Willy Wonka, but the entire episode is basically one giant parody of the movie. There are lines, story beats, and music ripped straight from the source. And some of the characters are more hilarious and exaggerated versions of the ones found in the movie. Chumba, wumba, gobbledy gorse. Count yourself lucky, you're not a horse. However, we don't remember Charlie getting kicked in the shin by an Oompa Loompa. Chumba, wumba, go ah! Number 9. Poltergeist As if the title Petergeist wasn't any indication, Yes, this whole episode is basically a riff on the 1982 horror classic Poltergeist. Much like the haunting in that movie stems from houses being built upon skeletal remains, this one kicks things off when Peter discovers the skull of an indigenous person in his backyard. Instead of leaving it, his exhuming it kicks off a whole series of spooky references, starting with Stewie talking to TV static a la Heather O'Rourke. They're here. Who's here? The TV people. What? No, they did a spin-off. Um, he's still playing Joey, but uh, uh, it's not doing so well. Chris is then visited by Ronald McDonald instead of your run-of-the-mill clown doll, before the tree scene turns into Herbert fighting it like it's the Balrog. You shall not pass! There's honestly a lot of spoofs in this one, and they all get our stamp of approval. Number 8. The Friday the 13th Franchise it's kind of endearing to see a psychopathic serial killer gleefully talking about the wildlife returning to a newly cleaned lake. I think this is really going to revitalize tourism. And then he nonchalantly stabs two teenagers. An oddly nice Jason Voorhees makes numerous appearances throughout the show, including once as a store manager threatening to kill his employee, and another time as a loving dad dropping off his psychotic son at camp. Don't look at me, I'm just here to drop off my son. Justin? Justin? There's something oddly funny about the way the writers have decided to portray Jason in the series. Sure, he retains his bloodlust, but he also seems to have a giant heart. It's that odd disconnect that makes his appearances so much fun. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, <laughs> endures all things. Number 7. Fast Times at Ridgemont High We don't know what it is about the scenes ripped directly from movies, but they always seem to be the funniest. In this episode, Meg develops a crush on Tom Tucker. While watching him on television, she has a vision of Tom swimming in a pool, calling her cute, stripping off his shirt, and making out with her. This is inspired by the famous scene from the classic teen comedy Fast Times at Ridgemont High, although it is infinitely sexier in the movie. Sorry, but watching a grown, mustachioed, hairy-chested man making out with a teenager is not exactly our idea of sexy. Like Brian says, it's awkward. Number 6. Raiders of the Lost Ark Seth MacFarlane apparently loves him some Indiana Jones, because Family Guy certainly loves to reference it. If Peter isn't using the sunlight and a scepter-like device to find a notebook in his attic, then he's being chased by the indigenous people of a foreign land and escaping at the last minute on a plane. 
the scene is right out of Raiders of the Lost Ark, complete with the exact same music and quotes. And this being Family Guy, Meg hilariously drops dead from the numerous blow darts in her back. And to think, that was all due to Chris becoming a freshman. Number 5. Back to the Future This Family Guy parody has everything. Time travel, alternate timelines, guitars, and tons of Back to the Future references. Stay tuned for President Ronald Reagan's weekly radio address. Ronald Reagan? The actor? He's president? Peter, you're the one from the future. You should know. Ah, forget it. After complaining about missing the single life within earshot of death, Peter is transported back to the 80s to relive his younger years. Only he misses his chance with Lois, and when he gets back to the future, she's married to Quagmire. Let's go upstairs and do it. Okay! Well, if you're familiar with the adventures of Marty McFly, you can guess what happens next. Peter goes back to 1984 and has to win Lois's heart at the big dance, while Earth Angel plays in the background. You can probably also guess that he succeeds, and that Brian and Rick Astley get their moment in the spotlight. Number 4. And Then There Were None Who knew that Family Guy and Agatha Christie could go so well together? And Then There Were Fewer, a play on the film adaptation's title, follows the same plot as Christie's story, only, you know, with Family Guy characters. Good evening, everyone. This entire episode works not only as a parody of the murder mystery genre as a whole, but also as a legitimately interesting story in and of itself. Oh my god, Peter, back it up! Oh, really, Lois? I thought I might drive forward. I thought that, that might be a fun thing to do. We're actually left wondering who the killer could be, all the while laughing at the goofy genre hallmarks that the episode brings attention to. Because I'm the one with the giant magnifying glass. Is my eye big? Plus, it's just awesome to see all the characters together in one place even if they're dropping like flies. Number 3. Ferris Bueller's Day Off Family Guy just loves borrowing from the 80s, don't they? This moment is taken from the events of the Family Guy movie, Stewie Griffin The Untold Story, which was first released direct to DVD, then aired on TV as part of season 4. Here, Stewie races to the swim meet at the community pool. Of course, this being Family Guy, it must be done through parody, and the recipient this time is Ferris Bueller's Day Off. The scene follows the climax of the movie to a T, including Stewie going back for the sunbathing babes, stealing a drink, and running alongside his father, all to the tune of the movie score. Too bad it doesn't end well, because Stewie just had to jump in slow motion while everyone else proceeded at normal speed. Probably shouldn't have milked that landing. Number 2. The Shawshank Redemption The Shawshank Redemption is often considered one of the greatest movies ever made. So of course Family Guy couldn't keep their hands off it. This is the last of the aforementioned Three Kings parody episode, but boy is it the best of the trilogy. Oh, we've only had one conversation, but I can tell we're gonna be lifelong friends. This installment is particularly good at poking fun at the various contrivances of the story, like the warden throwing a rock directly at the poster, or Red remembering the name of the obscure Mexican village. Shit. We love the movie, but the episode does bring up some interesting points. Number 1. Star Wars Original Trilogy Could it really have been anything else? It's no surprise that the writers and producers of Family Guy are huge Star Wars fans, as there have been many fantastic parodies and homages aimed at the franchise over the years. I'm Luke Skywalker. Me and Han Solo and Obi-Wan are here to rescue you. Wait, Obi-Wan Kenobi? Yeah. Suddenly I'm not so fat, huh? That being said, it's their three-part Laugh It Up fuzzball series that truly takes the crown. This series of episodes directly parodies the original three Star Wars movies, but it does so in a very caring manner. The series is a clear love letter to the films, but it also pokes fun at their many, many flaws and inconsistencies. Why are you wearing Han's clothes? Seriously, watch the actual movie. Lando is wearing Han's clothes in this scene. It's really weird. Okay, seeing as how we started with Family Guy's best episodes, it's only fitting that we end with their worst ones. And no, they're not all Meg episodes. Take a look.
kids. Remember how when you were little, you always wanted a neck, Uncle? No. Well, now you got one! <laughs> Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 worst Family Guy episodes. I'm sorry, I was just coming down the stairs at the same time. For this list, we're looking at episodes of the long-running show that have fallen flat for their fans over the years. Spoilers will be mentioned, so this is your official warning. Which episode of Family Guy do you think deserves to be on this list? Number 20. Cutaway Land Cutaway scenes may be one of the most iconic aspects of Family Guy, and have been a staple of the show since the first season. So you'd think a whole episode centered around the Griffins stuck in a world entirely composed of those scenes would be nostalgic and hilarious all at once. Unfortunately, that isn't the case. B as in, by God, that's Robert Loggia. Oh God, there are reruns in Cutaway Land. I remember this one, it takes a while. While some classic jokes are included, it isn't enough to make up for the lack of plot. The show seems content for the family to bounce from scene to scene, with not much logic to back it up. The real kicker is when it's revealed that it was all just a dream, a trope that had already grown stale by the time this aired. We were so worried. I wasn't that worried. Number 19, Vestigial Peter. Oh my God, it's a little me. Well, looks as if he's more fully formed than we thought. Wow, your wife is gorgeous. Is that a foot? This is awesome! After Peter discovers a vestigial twin in his neck, he decides to befriend it. He grows weary of his new brother quickly and opts to have him surgically removed. Afterwards, the rest of the Griffins insist the twins stay, and he proceeds to take over as the head of the family. I'm wearing those good old-fashioned values on which we used to rely. What the what the hell is going on here? While this concept seems interesting at first, Chip, the twin in question, becomes annoying almost immediately. Between his constant positivity and grating high-pitched voice, it quickly becomes apparent why Peter wants to kick him out. Hey, Peter! What's that? Oh, he's gonna turn you into a pile on Joe's lawn. What? Here, let's play steak catch. Oh, boy, I got it! Beyond Chip's characterization, the plot itself ends up being predictable in one note. If that were stronger, then the depiction may not be so irritating. But all it does is exacerbate the negative aspects. Number 18, Quagmire's Mom. Quagmire is interesting. Despite having hilarious moments, he's also a well-established creep. When he's caught with a teenager, it seems that he'll finally face consequences for his actions. That is, until his mother makes a sudden appearance. Your Honor, as the defendant's mother, I ask that you show mercy on him. Well, as the victim's mother, I ask that you go to hell. Where is your daughter? Show her to us! She confirms that he's only this way because she was promiscuous when he was a child. Not exactly the most airtight defense. Right as he and the viewers accept his sentence, the judge makes a last-second decision to rescind it, due to the inappropriate relations Quagmire's mother had with him. So, to sum it all up, Quagmire commits a horrible crime and then gets to walk away scot-free. Even Peter points out how ridiculous the circumstances are, and people at home cannot help but agree with him. Ah, oh, Quagmire got away with it and learned nothing. That's great. Number 17, Brian's a bad father. Hey, Dad. I know we haven't talked in a while, but I'm calling because I'm on my way to Quahog. Yes, we know it's the name of the episode. Yes, we know eventually Brian and his estranged son Dylan make up, but the lead-up to all this is so cringe-inducing, so forced, that the ends hardly justify the means. You're a terrible father. I never want to see you again! Brian even uses Stewie to apologize for him when Dylan demands space from his father. All this after Brian used the son he never wanted to further his writing career. Meanwhile, the typically wacky antics of Peter and his friends are replaced by arguing, betrayal, and shooting each other in the face. This episode really knows how real-life, relatable families and friendships work. Number 16, Brian Griffin's House of Pain. Where do we begin on this bowling ball-sized ball drop? Possibly with the B story, which explores the incredibly irresponsible sides of Chris and Meg. In this episode, they accidentally push their little brother down the stairs, causing a massive head wound. Instead of bringing their injured sibling to the hospital, they cover it up for weeks. When Peter finds out, he informs them this is a regular occurrence, and even helps them blame Lois for the whole ordeal. When you were babies, I used to knock you kids out every month or so. Yeah, it's as bad as it sounds, and the A story's no better either. Truly a disappointing episode. Number 15, Peter Problems. 
After being promoted to forklift operator at the brewery, Peter immediately takes advantage of his new position and uses the machinery around town until he's eventually fired. Afterwards, Lois becomes the breadwinner, and he becomes impotent as a result. Well, somebody's gotta have sex with me. Lois, don't say that. Quagmire will show up like the Roadrunner. <laughs> he instantly becomes a caricature of a house husband, complete with a personality change. The portrayal of stay-at-home dads as weak and incompetent did not sit well with viewers. Beyond that, it also contains one of the most infamous scenes in the show's history. Peter attempts to use the forklift to help a beached whale, only to immediately eviscerate it instead. The brutal scene stands out among the weak story, and it becomes the standout moment for all the wrong reasons. Your whale come! <laughs> oh, cool shell! Number 14, Con Eris. This show is no stranger to stretching out bits to an uncomfortable extent, but Con Eris takes it to a whole new level. That's Margaret Woolworth, Carrington Von Schumacher, Chanel Astor, Livingston, Comte de Saint Exupery, Mountbatten, Windsor, Armani, Roosevelt, Von Trapp, Wickenham, Hearst, Montgomery, Rothschild, Johnson & Johnson, Twillsworth, Dolce Gabbana. Brian, Stewie, and Quagmire fight for the inheritance of an elderly heiress, whose name is so long that it takes nearly a minute to say. The payoff is minimal, and to make things worse, it's repeated several times. Happy birthday, dear Margaret Woolworth, Carrington, Von Schumacher, Chanel, Astor, Livingston, Comte de Saint, Zuba, Combatant, I'm uh, just gonna hang here for a minute. The subplot isn't any better. Peter and Chris essentially fight for Herbert's attention after he mistakes the older Griffin as another teenager. Between that and Herbert's unnecessary song, it's apparent that they were just trying to fulfill the time requirement. Torn between two creepy B story, and is only a brief reprieve from the draining main plot. Number 13, Excellence in Broadcasting. Throughout the first few seasons, Brian is portrayed as a liberal with progressive ideas. He even fights for the legalization of same-gender marriage and marijuana, and fans respected that he was consistent. All that went out the window when Excellence in Broadcasting aired. After Rush Limbaugh makes a surprise visit to Quahog, Brian wants to heckle him, but instead ends up becoming a fan. Oh my god! Rush Limbaugh was right all along. Conservative republicanism is the answer. Good. Good for Brian. This is already wildly out of character, but it's made even worse when he blindly agrees with everything the controversial host says. He even sings about the wonders of being a Republican. I dream of Republican town, the place where the happiest smile is Cheney's frown. I'll bet you a buck you won't find a damn thing wrong, cause when you come down to it, this is where we all belong. It's a complete 180 to the character they had built up until this point, and they never go back. Brian has been a contrarian ever since. Number 12, April in Quahog. He mistreats his kids, makes fun of his wife, treats his friends like trash, destroys the town every chance he gets, etc, etc. Listen, we know Peter Griffin is designed to be a mean character. However, deep down, he's always seemingly loved his family and would do anything to protect them, or so we thought. All that is tarnished in this episode when he admits that he in fact hates spending time with his children. I just hate being around the kids. What? So much for the idiot with a heart of gold. Don't worry, he buys the kids' love back with an Xbox. Oh, and they bring back Surfin' Bird again. Hilarious. Number 11, Trump Guy. Donald Trump's presidency provided plenty of material for comedy writers, and Family Guy decided to throw their hat in the ring. After Peter secures a job in his cabinet, the Griffins decide to move to Washington, D.C., where Meg is assaulted by Trump. Many feel that while using Trump and his time in office was fair game, using his lewd allegations as fodder for jokes is crossing the line. Mr. President, please, I'm not interested. You'll regret this. Matota. <laughs> Afterwards, Peter fights him. However, it's nearly indistinguishable from his brawls with the giant chicken. The only aspect that sets it apart from other duels is the fact that it takes place in D.C. Sarah, any update? I haven't had the chance to ask the president if he's fighting with Peter Griffin. 
While the plot is ambitious, it's clear the show bit off more than it could chew. Number 10. You Can't Handle the Booth This show is no stranger to meta jokes, but they still took a risk by stretching one out across 20 minutes. This is bull crap. I'm calling Fox or Disney payroll right now. Fox or Disney payroll. Yeah, hi. This is Lois Please Griffin. Hold. Uh, of course. While recording commentary for a fictional episode, things devolve as Peter and Lois reveal past partners and pay disparities. However, viewers found it hard to care about the fight due to the couple having relationship-ending arguments weekly. Not being able to see any of the action hinders the quality of the story, and the format grows old early on. At one point, they even have the voice actors talk to the characters. However, it just comes across as a way to easily resolve the earlier fight, and the resolution feels unearned. Uh, my name's Alex Borstein, and I do your voice on the show. Are you saying the rough-edged comedy manager from The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel does my voice? <laughs> I'm so honored! I love that show! You are hilarious! Yeah, Seth Green already did this bit. While the idea is interesting, the execution ultimately makes it fall flat. Number 9. The 2,000-Year-Old Virgin as if the first appearance of Jesus wasn't risky enough, the show decided to bring him back, this time in a much different light. Peter, listen, I found the woman who I'd like to lose my virginity to. It's someone who understands me and someone I feel very close to. Oh, wow, Jesus, that's great! Hey, is it Carrie Underwood? Somebody told me you guys went out once. Yeah, we did, but it was a disaster. The Son of God is portrayed as a manipulative creep, which numerous people find to be out of line. He manages to convince Peter that Lois is the only woman good enough for him, and Peter reluctantly agrees. However, it's quickly revealed that Jesus does this annually, and constantly finds new couples to manipulate. Even after Jesus is called out, the deity simply explains it away as a test. Oh, so it was a test. Like when your father told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? Yes, that. That's exactly right. Uh, well, I can see my work here is done. The ending feels rushed, and the story fizzles out instead of being properly settled. While there are some funny bits, the controversy surrounding the religious figure's depiction took center stage. Number 8. Turban Cowboy We're not sure what the writers were thinking with this one. After a skydiving accident, Peter is hospitalized, where he befriends a man named Mahmoud. As they become closer, Peter decides to convert to Islam. Things go wrong almost instantly when Peter unknowingly joins a sleeper cell that has the intention of destroying a bridge in Kohog. Who is better, Hulk Hogan or the Iron Sheik? Um, the Iron Sheik? Okay, he is one of us. The jabs feel intentionally mean-spirited compared to past gags about religion. The backlash was swift, with multiple critics calling it Islamophobic. The poorly timed Boston Marathon joke, which aired only a month before an actual attack on the race, did not help. It was a disappointing route for them to go down, considering how interesting it could have been to see the family learn about other cultures. So what happens next? Do those guys all get trials? Well, you know, some of them. It's, uh, it's, it's a song. It's the process. Whatever. Number 7. Peter Rassment This show isn't exactly known for its hard-hitting commentary. In an attempt to shine a light on the harassment of men in the workplace, they wrote an episode about Peter being sexually harassed by his then-boss, Angela. Yeah, this is gonna work out just fine. <laughs> Excuse me. They do touch on some double standards, like how men being victimized by women is taken less seriously. However, any cogent point they make is immediately erased when they completely absolve the perpetrator of any wrongdoing. Griffin? I haven't been with anyone in 10 years, and when you spurned my advances, it was a wake-up call. No one's ever gonna love me again. Wait a minute. So that's why you've been acting like such a wacky ass around me? Eventually, Peter is essentially guilted into sleeping with Angela to prevent her from taking her own life. The lack of justice, although realistic, is disheartening. The audience couldn't help but feel like the ending was bleak, and found the whole story to be uncomfortable. Everything worked out perfect. Not really, Peter. Yeah, you cheated on your wife. No, I didn't. I used Mort. Oh my god, I forgot about Mort. I want my two dollars! Number 6. Quagmire's Dad This installment of the series is primarily known for having aged like milk. After meeting Glenn's parent, the guys are shocked when she comes out as Ida, a trans woman. After her surgery, the rest of the characters proceed to misgender her and mock her to her face and behind her back. I made a crumble! Oh, how thoughtful. 
throw it away in the outside garbage. Even Brian, who had slept with her post-surgery, vomits upon learning the truth. The reaction from everyone feels incredibly overblown, and it makes the viewing experience uneasy. It's a needlessly cruel episode about an already marginalized community, and many viewers feel that it's punching down far too much. Listen, I, I feel awful about the things I said last night. I was selfish. Oh, you weren't selfish. I realize I put a lot on you. I was wrong to just assume that you would understand and be able to accept this. But trust me, I had been unhappy for a long, long time. Wow. Well, all I want is for you to be happy. You're my dad. And if you're happy, I'm happy for you. I'm sorry, Dad. While Ida is treated more kindly now, it's hard to forget her introduction. Number five. Fresh air. All right, here comes the meteor-sized ball drop. Collectively, the worst part about this episode is all the uncomfortable jokes. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're not supposed to be doing this. From Carter giving his grandson, um, a hand, to Peter attempting to marry his son, one may notice the absence of laughter and the rise of sounds like ooh and ooh, wow. I don't, I don't know what to do now. I don't have the parenting skills necessary to deal with this. I say we never speak of this again. I... I might move. Feel that chill down your spine? That's your brain trying to escape your body and hide from this episode. So Peter tries to marry Chris so that he can steal the money that Carter left to him. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I... I took the one less traveled. Now, I ain't no scholar, but if that's not a metaphor for Major League butt stuff, I don't know what is. Pay attention to this recipe, people. One cup of ugly motivations and a whole lot of awkwardness make for a perfectly terrible episode. Number four, Herpy the Love Sore. From babies getting pregnant to babies getting herpes, this Family Guy episode sets a new low for the series. Brian and Stewie become blood brothers, but Brian fails to mention to his infant friend that he has herpes. This causes Stewie to get the disease too, and after some pitiful attempts at revenge, the two end up reconciling. Brian tells Stewie that the reason he didn't tell Stewie about the herpes was that he was embarrassed. And as if that was an acceptable excuse, Stewie forgives him and just accepts the fact that he has herpes for the rest of his life now. All right, no more. Just talking about this episode makes one need a shower. What the hell do you guys want from me? I want to drive your Prius to the end of the block all by myself. That's it? Yes. Okay. Yay! That's, uh, that's way past the end of the block. Yeah, his room's empty. I don't think he's coming back. Huh. Number three, Seahorse Seashell Party. This one's a doozy, drawing bad ideas from the others on this list. Bang, bang! I'm gonna finger bang you, Chris! Ha <laughs> not if I finger bang you first, Dad! Bang, bang! I'm gonna finger bang the two of you at the same time! Bang, bang! Hey, me too! Bang! Oh, no one wants to get finger banged by you, Meg. Why don't you just go finger bang yourself, Meg? It's a bottle episode with more drama than comedy that focuses yet again on emotional mistreatment. Yeah, shut up, Meg! No! You shut up, Chris! I am sick of all you guys ganging up on me. You guys all think you're so much better than me. Oh, Meg, that is the least fancy thing I have ever heard. While we have to give Meg some kudos for finally standing up for herself, she completely goes back on it all by deciding to be the family's martyr. Maybe if I feel bad, they don't have to. Wow. You know, that's incredibly noble and mature, Meg. You know, I think you might be the strongest person in this house. You mean that, Brian? Absolutely. We get that Family Guy likes to make taboo jokes and take controversial angles, but the ending pretty much communicates that people in toxic relationships should stay there. And there's nothing funny about that. You guys, I have something to say. You're right. It's all my fault. What? Number two, Stewie is enceinte. This is a nine months pregnant sized ball drop. What we mean by that is in this episode, Stewie gets pregnant. I think I'm gonna throw up. Oh, save the cheap theatrics. This isn't one of your crappy short stories. This is real life, mister, so man up! Taking his implied obsession with his friend Brian to a whole new level, Stewie uses some scientific mumbo-jumbo to impregnate himself using Brian's DNA. While that is certainly a visual we never asked for, the babies they produce are even worse. It all caps off with them leaving the abominations at a local animal shelter and everything returning to normal. But it'll never be normal again, will it? 
Some sights can never be unseen, no matter how many times you wash your eyes. Number 1. Screams of Silence – The Story of Brenda Q Do you know what Family Guy, the cartoon featuring an evil mastermind baby and a talking dog, needs? A serious story about abuse, of course. This episode is littered with head-shaking moments, like the scene between Quagmire's sister and her husband that everyone in the neighborhood is able to hear. Did you change the channel while I was going to get a beer? Oh, yeah. I I'm sorry, honey. I just wanted to see who was on Letterman. We're watching Leno, you I'm so sorry. His soft, gentle humor connects effortlessly with my mainstream sensibilities. It's a scene that plays out in excruciating detail, and one that just makes you wince and ask, why? While the episode ends on a positive note for Brenda Quagmire, it teaches the audience that the best way to deal with abuse is revenge and, ultimately, murder. You know, classic comedy. It's a little rough, Peter. I didn't write it, Joe did. I wanted it to sound real. It's gotta sound like he wrote it. Plus, she kinda is garbage, Quagmire. All right, well, that's gonna do it for yet another deep dive into the Griffin clan. Hope you found lots to laugh over. I certainly did. I've been Matt from Watch Mojo, and I'll see you next time.